An amazing piece of advice for a lot of kids, um, 50 year olds, whoever's listening right now is like saving money is a good strategy. Like we didn't have, like I didn't have stuff but it was because my parents were saving, they were saving, they were saving and my mom spent, we didn't get toys, like go outside and like paint a rock, right? It was like very, very smart because after seven or eight years he was able to buy uh, a liquor store of his own in Springfield, New Jersey, Shoppers Discount Liquors, he built up a great business, three, four million dollar a year business, like made it, right? Like literally made it, middle class, upper middle class, made it. We didn't ever need anything, they didn't spend a lot, they're big savers, but we made it and then I got dragged into it at 14, you know, oldest son, I'm one of three, I was the oldest son. 14 can even be in a liquor store? Yeah, because nobody was really checking, <laughs> but you know, good question, that's pr- probably not. 16 you could get a permit, but I was in there at 14, that's probably why they put me in the basement, bagging ice, stocking shelves, and um, somewhere around 16, 17 I realized that people collected wine and that caught my attention because I was deep into baseball cards and comic books at that point. And, um, and I really, really enjoyed learning the wine world and really became fascinated by it. And that all manifested a couple years later to me launching in 1996 uh, a site called winelibrary.com. We rebranded the store to Wine Library and, uh, and that started my first chapter, right? It, it, we grew the business from a three to four million dollar a year business to a, initially a 45 and a 60 million dollar a year business in a very short period of time on the back of what I love reading your stuff about, which is business innovation, you know, email marketing, having a website 21 years ago for a single store wine shop, liquor shop in New Jersey was like having a VR studio in a flower shop right now in Iowa. Right, it's like you, Yahoo, Craigslist. It was super early. I mean, there was like, you know, there was, there was, there was wine.com got like a trillion dollars in funding. It was so early. There was literally not 10. How did you, how did you know to do that? I went on the internet, you know, in 94 and in four seconds landed on AOL bulletin board where people sold baseball cards. And I just knew. The same way I knew that Twitter would be big and that's why I invested or Tumblr or Facebook or Uber or, you know, I've done Snapchat, I've done really well on one core principle, which is I think I have intuitive ability to understand consumer behavior more than the average bear, and I'm not scared to bet the farm on that gut feel, right? And so, um, even online dating, I met my wife on JDate, right? In 2003, when it was, was right, and when it was super like, Sacrilege. Only two users? No, it was pretty, you know, New York Jew, Jewish dating scene was pretty hopping. But I just remember thinking, like, in 10 years, every single person, I didn't think they'd be swiping to the right, but like, I'm like, every person's gonna do this because this is practical. And so people are romantic. People are like, well, I'll never buy a tomato on the internet. This is what I heard in 96. I'm like, okay, hey, well, because time is valuable, because other things matter more. And so, uh, I knew because I thought people would buy stuff on the internet long before a lot of people thought. So that's still 10 years before you really became known for your yes. YouTube videos. That's right. That's where I think a lot of people assume that your career kind of started, but you were working behind the scenes for 10 years building up this internet business. I think the thing that I'm most proud of is that when people try to take a razz at me as like a self-promoter, uh, and I'm very empathetic to that because I do so much around my personal brand, um, I'm empathetic, but if they even spent four seconds digging and realizing I didn't say a word until I was in my mid-30s and had already built an enormously large business, at least not, not by tech standards, but no cash infusion, 10% gross profit, liquor store in the mid-90s to grow to that scale was very hard, right? media has been fun for me. I would tell you secretly, and I haven't said this a lot, I'm trying to give you a nugget for your podcast, I needed to build VaynerMedia for myself because I was starting to become Gary Vee, to your point. The wine videos kind of put me on the map. I read a book in 2009 called Crush It, which gets me into the, you're a motivational speaker, you're a pundit, you're a, and it started becoming about my personality and me on Twitter more than my business accomplishments. So I needed Vayner. I needed to build an agency against the biggest firms on Madison Avenue, and I needed this big success, even to just remind myself that I'm entrepreneur and operator and actual businessman first. I'm not what I think there's a lot of right now, which is a lot of people running around and saying they're an entrepreneur on Instagram. Um, I'm proud of that. 
You know, like I look at something that is upsetting to me. When I see Yik Yak sell for four million dollars, you know, I feel bad for the guys. And it used to be worth four hundred million. Correct. But I don't feel bad because that's entrepreneurship. That's business. And I think a lot of people are getting confused right now of what success actually looks like. Only a very few will break through and actually sell their business, actually go public, actually make it. And um, and I have a lot of pride in the fact that since the day I graduated from college, I've run two businesses every day of my life. Either Wine Library or VaynerMedia. No in between, no being a personality, no being a speaker. It may feel that way because of the content I've put out, but every day of my life, for the last 20 years, I've been the CEO or operator of a business every single day, and both of them are massively all-time successful within their genres. My friends, you wanna talk about something that has completely become something nobody talks about? Nobody talks about saving money. Like, it's just not a conversation. Like, there's a very easy way to do this. If you make 49,000 a year, live as if you're making 27. Everybody lives over what they make. No wonder you can't save money. Your apartment's too nice. Of course you can't save money. Your car is too fancy. Of course you can't save. You're buying clothes you can't afford. There are motherfuckers that complain to me and this is where I'm, listen, if you're DMing me or emailing me, know that I don't fucking fool around. When you DM me and say, meh, I can't, I can't, the first thing I do is go to your account. Don't let me hear that you're broke as fuck and the first fucking story I click on, you're drinking a $7 fucking coffee. If you're broke, you're not allowed to take Uber. Take the bus, dick. <laughs> we need to start saving money to get at, are you in a shit spot? Are you in debt? You don't like it? There's gonna be no fast track to a million dollars that's gonna fix that. It's gonna be taking a step back and drinking a whole lot of humility, not a fucking French latte. I don't get it. People are always like, Gary, your story about you building your dad's business, that's not true. Like, you fucking, like, that can't be true. You had money to invest in Twitter and all that shit. I know your story, I'm like, okay, right. Because when I made $53,000 a year, I had a $2,000 a month apartment, then I moved down to a $1,400 one because I wanted to save more money, and I bought nothing for a decade. I went out zero times, I bought no clothes, I wore liquor t-shirts to fucking work. <laughs> I fucking spent no money. Not super complicated. I, how many people here are immigrants or the children of immigrants? Raise your hands. Raise them high. How many people are the children of? Keep your hands up. And how many are the actual immigrants? Awesome. Immigrants have this shit figured out. Immigrants come here, they work, and they fucking save money. I went on one and a half fucking vacations my entire childhood. We went to, fuck, actually, we went to Orlando. <laughs> We stayed in the fucking Holiday Inn and my mom ate like one sandwich in the week. Immigrant shit. Immigrant shit. Everybody cries about immigrants. They don't spend money on dumb shit, motherfucker. Try it. Try it. Save money and then do your thing. It's about patience. Where everybody gets caught up, now they're sitting. Somebody's sitting here. Sally's sitting here. She's 39. She's like, okay, this makes fucking sense. And then she's like, but fuck. And, I'm, and she's like, it's gonna take too long. And I'm like, Sally, you're 39. Do you wanna be miserable as shit for the next 60 years? Or do you wanna have some grinding years for the next seven and be 46 and young as shit and start the process of actually being happy? People's complete inability to take one step backwards, to take two steps forward, is destroying people. Do you know how many, how many people here own their home? Do you know how many of those people should sell it? I'm being serious. Do you know how many people have no liquid cash 
their home is their drain and what they should do is sell the home and either buy a smaller one or rent to give themselves liquid to be able to go on the offense, but their home, which oh by the way, has four too many rooms. No, like, do you know few people have a home that actually fits their actual reality? People have homes with four extra rooms or live in a town that makes it look better for them. Man, there's so many fucking fucked up moves out here, my friends. I haven't even started. You know, a lot of people think that you know, from the success that you've had, maybe you came from success, but your beginnings are pretty humble. You know, it's right? funny, if I was listening right now and didn't know the person, I actually think a lot of times that people that are successful made it. I'm actually one of the few people, or maybe the majority, I don't know, it's so funny, I actually think my kids are gonna have a harder time being successful than I was. I think being born in Belarus, coming here with nothing, my, my parents working every minute, um, that instilled a huge competitive advantage, uh, a chip on my shoulder, a work ethic, uh, that I, you know, I think there's a very good reason that in the American meritocracy system, to the, you know, by comparison, uh, there's always stuff, but, in capitalism, or the version that we've lived through in the last 50 years in America, immigrants win a lot. Um, and they win a lot because um, of a couple core things. So yeah, I didn't start with a lot. You know, I have friends who started with a lot who've now built on top of it and I'm impressed because I used to think that was a disadvantage. So I think there's a million ways to do it. Uh, I, like the narr- I like my dad's narrative the best. I mean, he was 22 when he came to America and had nothing. So that's a really amazing story. I'll take mine though. Um, and so baseball cards, lemonade. Yeah, you know, you're I was doing a, all, those all kind of things things that stuff. kids try and do when they're actually entrepreneurial minded. So you had a series of lemonade stands, right? Yes. One. <laughs> yes. Forget one. Like, let's make a franchise. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I didn't know it was a franchise when you're <laughs> six. I just knew that there was a lot of kids in my neighborhood, and I thought Marissa Bird and Eric Godfrey and Robbie Turnick should put in a good days of work. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I've, I've always had the knack for. And, and, and actually, what I was about to say, I've just always had a knack for branding. So like, even with the lemonade stands, it was like Gary's lemonade stands. And I worked on the signs all day, more so than the lemonade itself. Uh, and then I learned you had to make good lemonade to build an actual business, so that taught me lifetime value and quality. Like, I learned a lot as a kid. I was a very poor student, which was really unusual for immigrants. Um, but I didn't see education as my way out. I knew that I had it, and that, originally started as I'm a good salesman and then it was I'm a good businessman and then it was I'm a good operator and now the current term is I'm a good entrepreneur. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a DNA thing with me.